Hi, this is Sasha from GNAT News. Today we're at the Arlington Rec Park. And behind me is a group of people that are digging. And we're going to go find out from the lead just what are they after here at the Arlington Rec Park. Come on. Hi, my name is Farah Ash. I am the Habitat Steward for the Baton Kill Watershed Sisma. That's Comprehensive Invasive Species Management Association. We are here at the Arlington Rec Park today and we uh, are removing invasive species. Yeah. Oh. Double invasive. What are you after here in the park today? We are after mostly uh, oriental bittersweet, which is an invasive woody vine. And is it this? Uh, no, this is actually a uh, grape, which is native so, uh, in the state so of I, Vermont. So I picked up the wrong thing. Is <laughs> that what you're saying? <laughs> this is a sample of part of a larger vine of oriental bittersweet. Uh, you can tell that the bark isn't as shaggy, although um, when it's young, it, it looks more like this. These things get big and huge. They look like mm -hmm. Tarzan vines. You can yes. swing on these <laughs> things. And do we have any sense of how it got here? You can find uh, bittersweet vines uh, that are made into holiday wreaths. Um, so, and That's also handy. it was brought over <laughs> as, um, as an ornamental, so as, a, as an attractive plant to, to put in your, uh, your garden or, or in your hedges. This has been going on for hundreds, yeah, this hundreds is, of years? Yeah, this was brought over um, kind of around colonial times. It's it's pretty big problem within New England. Uh, it's, it's not a new problem, but um, definitely we are focused on some areas that are of uh, natural importance to the region that we want to make sure that those native plants that are there can do well. If you spot this, how do you get rid of it without it coming back next summer? Right now we are we are cutting these larger vines um, to kill it before it can produce fruit because that's the way it's reproducing is those fruit and especially birds transport the berries to different areas so we are kind of nipping that at the bud and then we are removing these small ones by hand we're pulling them so are these flowering at the moment uh they're just starting to form their berries for the really big ones and is it a pretty flower is that part of the reason why people stick these in the garden the berries are actually the attractive part of the plant these big ones are you trying to rip the entire root system out of the ground yes as much as we can and if you don't get the whole root system is it coming back yeah, that's why monitoring is very right. important. So when, whenever you do a invasive removal project, it's very important to come back a year later right. or even two years later to check on the area and, and pull those, those re-sprouts from the roots. Once you rip these out of the ground, is there a, anything special you need to destroy even the, the debris? Or is it fine once you, they die like everything else once you rip it out? We are actually bagging the material, especially the small stuff, so it can't re-root. Um, but another thing that you could do if you're just doing a small project is just hang it on a tree so those roots will dry out and die. If you were ranking this between 1 and 10 as um, one of the most invasive versus the least invasive, how, how do you think this is doing? Is this winning out? Um, yeah, I think this one is one of the kind of worst ones. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty up there uh, because it can climb trees and girdle them, which is a process of killing the tree by constricting its flow of nutrients. It's like a python. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly like a python. Um, so these are killing trees. They're not, oh, which I noticed with grapevines because I had a big grapevine that I left in my apple tree and it wiped out my apple tree. Right, so these vines are really dangerous, especially once they get in trees you care about. Yes, so they can twist around and up the tree and then uh, produce all of their all of their leaves on top, and they also can make it more vulnerable to storms. So, like when right. we had those wind storms, uh, this makes the trees with these heavy Got vines it. on top right. That's what all happened. the more vulnerable. One of the most interesting things I found out about you is that um, you believe in there's a unique way to help wipe these out, which is. Uh, you can cook them, yes. Can you eat this? I don't think so. No, but. you can't eat No, oriental. there's nothing good about this. This you can't put in a salad. It's all bad. Um, what else is in this area that you're after if you find it? A few of the edible ones are Japanese knotweed, the, uh, the shoots, so the stems are edible. Um, and especially early in the season, you can get out there and, and rip them up and it. Uh, use it in uh, like a strawberry rhubarb, use it similar to rhubarb. Got it. And then um, uh, my wife always tells me about garlic mustard. Garlic mustard, yes. And that's something else that's... 
yeah. invasive but edible. Yes, you can make a really good pesto out of it. I guess the, the advice from you is rip them out, eat them. Yeah, just make sure you get those roots out. Right, and, and eat the right things. Yes. And I well, might as well ask you this. Is there a place that I could go to, um, to, to see a picture of this again, if I forget it, to see a picture of these leaves, to see a picture of what's edible and what isn't? Yeah. Is that, your, is that your website? Yeah, so uh, my organization has a Facebook page, so come visit our Facebook page at the Battenkill Watershed Sisma. That's C-I-S-M-A. Um, and also vtinvasives.org uh, has all of these uh, at a pretty great outline uh, with pictures and how to identify them in the field and uh, a little explanation about why, why they're a problem in the area. Cool. Thank you uh, so much for joining us yes. today, helping us out. Okay. Okay, so I can see the plant, but there's something else you told me about the plant that's really cool to double check if you're actually ripping up yeah, the right thing. Yeah, so if you want to make sure that you have garlic mustard, one of the things you can do is you can rip off one of the leaves, crumple it up in your hands, and smell it. If it smells garlicky or oniony, uh, that's garlic mustard. If it just smells kind of like grass, then you got the wrong plant. <laughs> It was funny talking to Farrah today because we started out talking about one invasive species and then before we knew it, she was mentioning this one and then she was mentioning that one and you realize that this whole area, Southern Vermont, is filled with invasive species. I'll leave you with this final thought. I was recently up at the Canadian U.S. border. There's a place up there called Thousand Islands and it's along the big beautiful river and it's a tourist destination and it's wonderful. I was on a tour boat specifically a glass bottom tour boat going along the river looking down seeing remnants of old structures seeing fish all that stuff you'd expect the tour guide had sort of a love-hate relationship to our ability to actually do this and this is why because they have zebra mussels up there and zebra mussels as you, most of you know have are invasive and have spread all over the place causing all the damages that you hear about zebra mussels so on one hand she was going, ah, zebra mussels, but on the other hand she was going, oh my god, look how beautiful it is. I mean it's become a diver's paradise in a way because now divers can actually go down and see all the wrecks down there without being covered by this murky water. That's the cool and bad thing about invasive species is that some of them bring good stuff while bringing bad stuff. And that puts us in this tricky position. Anyways, Haas, GNET News, next time.